Welcome back. How digital is changing your world? Is it, you may say? Well, let me show some statistics on this. If we go back to 1790, the year 1790, around 90% of the available workforce was producing the goods and consumables that we would eat today. By 2010, that number had shrunk to less than 1%. But yet, our shops look like this. How can that be? Well, of course, it's through to automation and the Industrial Revolution. But our understanding of automation and robots tends to be somewhat jaded and old-fashioned, like it's a, some sort of a car factory where the robots just perform the same single repetitive task. That's no longer the case. We're starting to see robots creep into our workplace and replace much of the manual labour that we once thought was unreplaceable. We think of back into our, our retail outlets where once there used to be 30 cash registers, there's now 30 robots and two or three cash registers. And it doesn't stop there. Let's take a look at how robots are evolving and what this could mean to us in our own lives. Meet the Baxter Research Robot, a new generation of robots. The Baxter Research Robot is a complete platform for less than $30,000. The robot has two seven degree of freedom arms, three integrated cameras, two on the wrist and one on the head, as well as sonar and range finding sensors. Through the Software Development Kit, or SDK, Researchers have access to measurements and control of each of Baxter's 14 arm joints, and these include joint position, velocity. The interesting feature for me in that video was that the human replacement cost, the robot equivalent, was around $30,000. These robots know how to fold clothes, stack shelves, pour drinks, and more. And this is just the start. So over the next four to five years, we're going to start seeing a lot more mechanical muscle replacing what was always labor intensive jobs. And this technology adoption is going to do nothing other than speed up. Let's give a quick example. Back in 2005, this photograph shows the, uh, uh, the Pope being inaugurated in Rome. There is one lady who happens to have a camera phone and is taking a photograph of the event. But fast forward to 2013 and this is a photograph from exactly the same position. The technology is now ubiquitous. Everybody has one and they're not afraid to use it. And what we're seeing is this timeline between the release of new technology and the adoption is shrinking fast. This is product life cycles, something that marketers would have traditionally mapped out as a progression path for their product as it went through cycles of maturity. As we are seeing, due to the rapid adoption of technology, these life cycles are shrinking and shrinking further, so that the moment technology comes out, it can be su superseded and passed. So how do we build an organization that's built to cope with this? Well, first we need to gain a new perspective. Coming in the wings is technology called artificial intelligence. Our understanding of how artificial intelligence will affect us is, is somewhat warped. And it is warped, as this graph will show, is that if we look back in time and we look in history, we kind of see change as a progression that was slow and manageable. Records, vinyl, they lasted about 100 years. Cassette tapes, around 50. CDs around 25. The download CD or the download of music that we paid for a further 15. We're now into subscription music models which are now surpassing the old purchase model. This is not a linear path. This is logarithmic scales. And with artificial intelligence coming, we perceive that it's actually going to accelerate rapidly, as this graph shows. Replacing many jobs that both require mechanical muscle, but also 
creativity and mechanical minds. Putting it another way, we're not too far away from seeing computational abilities superseding that of human performance. It's most certainly within the next 15 years. And with artificial intelligence in particular, it is approaching rapidly, as this little cartoon explains. The challenge that we face within our organizations is, are we built to cope with this kind of change? Are we flexible enough, innovative enough to be able to rise to the challenge? And this is not some scaremongering that's going on. These thought leaders, global thought leaders, are currently warning about artificial intelligence and its impact on humanity. These people need not seek fame or fortune. They have plenty of both. And I would heed their calls for us to be prepared for what's going to happen. Here's a quick look at the near term, a little publication that I've picked up. I read it. A couple of years ago, directors of a woman's clothing company asked me to help them to develop better fashion recommendations for their clients. No one in their right mind would seek my personal advice in an area I know so little about. I am, after all, a male computer scientist. But they were not asking for my personal advice. They were asking for the machine learning advice. And I obliged, based purely on sales figures and client surveys, I was able to recommend to women whom I'd never met before better than their own siblings. We're seeing recommendation engines starting to creep into our lives in e-commerce. We're seeing rapid increases in e-commerce. And I can also vouch that computer scientists are not good with fashion. Move forward into what we're seeing in our publications and the newspapers that we so long to read, these peer review uh, authorities. Most of what's actually appearing now is starting to be generated through artificial intelligence. We're seeing financial data that can be selected across many fields, analyzed, sentiment understood, and interpretations and predictions of the future made. These artificial intelligence engines are now starting to help the larger publications to create copy without the need for specialisms in journalism. So where will it stop? I'm going to introduce the ABC of disruption. Let me explain for a second. If I were just to take accounts for one second, then accountancy. We're seeing changes happening in countries at a state level where the state is saying, if you want to deal with us on a transactional basis, you must submit your tenders digitally, you must purchase from us digitally, invoice us digitally, we will pay you digitally, and we will track all uh, VAT and tax issues automatically. We're seeing changes in personal taxation in the United Kingdom where everything will be taxed as we go along rather than submitted at the end of the year. This has a massive profound impact on a profession that's as old as commerce. And what we will typically see the response of the industry is to hand wave, say mm, yes but, but we are actually up into the higher ends of corporate finance and what happens, as we see within disruption, is the nibbling starts at the bottom and rapidly moves up. The letter B, banking. Let's look at what nibbles at the bottom look like. Because banks once used to make money out of cash machines, make money out of foreign exchange, make money out of small loans. Now there are so many who have moved into the small loans area that they're finding to be uncompetitive. So they feeling the heat, move up into some form of higher corporate finance and in comes crowdfunding, a new internet phenomenon that would not have been possible before the connection of people through the web. What is it that the banks do? They tend to get a little bit hand wavy, buy more technology, invest in the technology and perceive that their position will be safe for another while. I'm afraid not. And we are only now on to the seas and cars. What's going to happen when automatic, autom automated driving vehicles appear on our roads? They're already in California and starting to permeate the United States. Whilst the technology isn't there just yet for fully automated autonomous vehicles, it's not too far off. And this won't have just an impact 
on us as individuals able to go for a night out without the worries of how we're going to get home, it will have a profound implication across many industries. How do you insure a car when you're not actually driving it? Why do you need a car? You only need a car to get you from A to B and it's parked 90% of the time. How does the city cope when cars are intelligent enough to be able to talk to one another? They understand how the city has to flow. They understand how the traffic system needs to go and where the line of least resistance will be to take you on a journey. Does your city or town need that bypass once this technology starts to creep into common usage? That's a burning question that they need to ask. But to me, the first burning question that I would ask you to ask yourself is, are you prepared for all of this?